Welcome to the Pharma Podcast, conversations with industry experts and business leaders about important and current topics in Canadian pharma, biotech, and medtech. I'm your host, Sam Tarantino. On this episode of the Pharma Podcast, my guest is Dr. Drew Taylor, founder and CEO of Acorn Biolabs. On today's episode, Drew and I will discuss his journey to entrepreneurship and the near future of regenerative medicine. Welcome to the Pharma Podcast, Drew. I'm, I'm excited to be here. This is uh, uh, the podcast that brings on the, the who's who of Canadian biotech, looking at Alaska's Jesse Buckstein and, and, and uh, Brian Bloom. I mean, I'm, I'm in pretty good company here. <laughs> Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Well, why don't we start? Let's, let's start by explaining to our audience what is regenerative medicine. So regenerative medicine essentially is using our own bodies, our own cells and tissues uh, to regenerate tissues elsewhere in our bodies. Um, and the idea is that if you have, you know, really lack of performance or disease, um, allowing that body to regenerate using yourself so that you're performing at the level before that incidence or before that disease started. And what attracted you to regenerative medicine? So it goes back a long way, um, all the way back to grade seven. Um, I, uh, at school, we had a science fair and we had to pick something mechanical to break down and, uh, and present on. And so, uh, I was the only kid in the grade that, uh, picked this, but I picked the total knee arthroplasty. So a fake knee. Um, and so part of that, I think it's probably not as easy to pull off today as it was back then, but I was able to actually go into the OR and witness a surgery firsthand, uh, which was an amazing experience, um, and really set a course for, for my entire career. Um, I watched every moment from the doctors meeting that patient for the first time and seeing this, this, you know, younger woman than I expected in a wheelchair, um, going into the OR through the double doors and getting that big smell of iodine and, and alcohol um, and just seeing everybody performing, you know, at their best, right? This entire team of people to, to accomplish this procedure. And it was just a, a wonderful experience for me to see. But the actual, you know, impactful part was really when uh, the, the post-op rounds, I got to, to shadow the, the surgeons and go and visit that patient the next day after surgery and actually watch them stand up the next day after surgery and embrace the physician because they were, you know, overwhelmed, um, really because of the quality of life that they were going to receive from this. And so it was a really magical moment and walking away from it. When I was just talking to the surgeon one-on-one, -on -one, I, I remarked about how incredible this experience was and how, how much of a difference, um, they had made in that young, young woman's life. And ultimately, uh, the physician said, yes, it is, it is incredible. Um, you know, but unfortunately she is younger and, and she'll need a revision surgery and probably another re revision surgery after that. And, uh, these implants don't last forever. Um, it's very successful surgery, but you know, 10 or 15 years and, and they do wear out. And so unfortunately she'll be back in that same position probably at the end of her life. And so we're, we're really just staving things off. Right. Um, and then they said something that stuck with me in your lifetime. Uh, you'll see us be able to actually regrow that patient's cartilage and give it back to them so that hopefully they have a lifelong solution that they can use and, and uh, really make sure that they, they live the rest of their life with, with full capacity, full performance from that joint. And, and so that stuck with me. So tell us about your journey uh, from sport to academia, to venture capital, to today entrepreneurship. Yeah, I've, I've had a, an interesting path, but I have to say it's probably my, uh, my father's fault. I had uh, some, some big shoes to fill. Uh, my dad was a professional baseball player. He went to U University of Toronto for engineering and, and then played 11 years of Major League Baseball. He was on some world championship teams in 1964 with the Cardinals and 1969 with the Mets. And then after all of that, went back to medical school and became a doctor. He's got a fantastic story. And so always in my head, I, I kind of figured I could do both. I, I mean, that's, that's what I knew. Um, so I, I took baseball very seriously and, and I took academics very seriously. And uh, I ended up going down to the University of Michigan and, and playing baseball for the Wolverines. 
Um, and coming out of, of Michigan, I actually got done my undergrad and my master's work while I was there and uh, applied to medical school and uh, was going to stay in Michigan for medical school. But I, uh, I ended up also getting offered a contract with the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, so I petitioned the, uh, the school to see if I could actually do both at the same time. Um, and after the dean was done laughing, um, I think they said, look, at it's appreciate what you're trying to do here, but that, that is impossible, right? You can't be gone for eight months of the year playing baseball and, and expect to maintain um, medical school, but um, you may be able to do a PhD. Have you thought about that? And so that was the first kind of idea in my mind of saying, okay, well, there's, there's this other path that I could maintain and do, do the, with the academic work as well. And so I quickly applied to PhD programs and that's actually what pushed me down, uh, kind of the research and, and the therapeutic development side. And so I ended up going to university of Toronto doing a PhD in biomedical engineering, um, and, uh, and specialized actually in, in that first experience, right? Cartilage regeneration. So I worked with the uh, bioskeletal tissues engineering team at Mount Sinai hospital and, uh, and played minor league baseball, um, back and went back and forth. So that was a, that was a pretty, uh, pretty special time. That's awesome. And then venture yeah. capital. You also said venture capital. Yeah, yeah. That's well, yeah. Well, you <laughs> neglected to mention you were a pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays and the Phillies. So I'll, 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 I'll say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like it was, it was, it was a fun run. It didn't last forever though. I, I needed some regenerative medicine back then. It was a little, a uh, little premature. But I, I tore my labrum and supraspinatus, so I had a short career. But um, I, uh, I loved every minute of it, and I was also able to to keep up the, the academic work as well. So it was time well spent. Good. And then from academia, then you got into venture capital. You you spent some time at uh, Epic, uh, Epic Capital. I did. Yeah, I had another big decision to make. I, I After the PhD, I wrote my MCAT again. I was accepted to medical school again. And I think at that point in my time in my life, I was, I was exhausted um, doing both and back and forth. And, you know, I can remember writing an exam at U of T, um, having an exam at U of T and having to fly in, you know, the evening before, write the exam, get back on a plane, back to Chicago and pitch that night. You know, it was, it was some pretty wild times. So I also started thinking of like, you know, I want to really like start a family and do all of these things. And so I ended up um, also at, at the same time as, as getting accepted to medical school getting a, a fantastic and, and really compelling offer to join a great team, a great group of, of people um, at Epic Capital Management. And so um, it was something that was a tremendous opportunity that they gave me. And so I was really excited to join their team and, uh, and really be part of uh, the diligence on a lot of these early stage healthcare companies coming out of Canada, you know, fantastic um, groups, uh, what spun out of universities and, and such, and, and was, was able to get, really get my hands dirty, seeing some of the amazing technology and IP coming out of Canadian universities and, and, and people. So from Epic, how did you, uh, how did you land at Acorn? So one of the, uh, one of the things that, um, we identified when I was doing my PhD and then, and then at Mount Sinai afterwards, um, was the starting material of the cells that we were using for this, for creating, you know, the re regenerated cartilage, the age of the individual we were harvesting it from was unbelievably important and really was the limiting factor in our ability to create functional tissues for people. Um, the work had been based on some really successful animal studies that had been run before. And my job going into that group was actually to translate that into human models. So it was great because I got my clinic fix. I was going into the OR again, uh, getting biopsies of patient cells and bringing them back to the lab to see if in practice, we could actually grow out functional tissues that one day uh, could be the basis of the work for, for these, you know, cartilage implants that could really restore the function of people's joints. Um, it was, it didn't go perfectly. All of the animal studies that we had done were in juvenile animals. So the equivalent of teenagers, and now we're going to the OR and taking biopsies of patient cells from older patients, right? In their time of need, they've had a lifetime of wear and tear, or they've got, you know, damage and, and things like osteoarthritis disease. And now we're taking those cells back to the lab and expecting them to perform again at their best. And it just doesn't really work like that. And so what, what we really identified was that the age of the individual was the most important contributing factor to our ability to actually grow at full thickness cartilage for patients. 
And that's a bad thing, especially when you think about cartilage regeneration. Most of the patients we're seeing are elderly, right? They're coming to us at the time of need. And now we're asking those cells at their worst to perform at their best. We really need to be getting access to better starting materials, right? The idea of regenerative medicine is not in a laboratory, you know, worrying about purity of chemical compounds to create pharmaceutical products, right? In regenerative medicine, the starting material is our own cells. And so therefore the end therapeutic is only going to be as powerful as the cells that we start with. And so it became abundantly clear to us at that time that the age of the individual and how far down a disease state was going to be the handcuffs that we'd be wearing. And so the idea of ACORN actually, in my mind, um, started back then. And I can remember sitting around a round table, speaking with other, other physicians about this. And the only plausible answer was actually to intercept that patient earlier in their timeline, right? And to potentially take a sample of cells that would be an ideal candidate in regenerative medicine and cryogenically preserve them. And, you know, people were doing that in fertility and it was a concept that was well understood. Um, the idea of cryogenically banking cells was done very successful, you know, successfully in other areas. And so translating that now into uh, disease management and regenerative medicine was, was a grand task. Now I went and I ended up leaving and, and working at Epic Capital, but while I was there, I ended up meeting, uh, uh, two, uh, you know, slightly younger, really bright, uh, individuals, um, from the University of Waterloo, they were working on, on that exact same problem. And so while I was at Epic, I ended up working with them for about a year, um, you know, a little bit of mentoring, a little bit about pitching in and, and study design. And uh, we ended up getting some, some unbelievably fa fascinating and, and influential results um, towards a solution of being able to access cells from a patient non-invasively. Right, the idea of drilling into your iliac crest and harvesting bone marrow prospectively is not that enticing for patients, right? High cost, high pain, uh, morbidity. There's a bunch of things that, that can go wrong and, and ultimately, you know, why patients would not want to do that. So we really looked at non-invasive sources. And once that initial work really identified the hair follicle as being the ideal source for this, um, that's when uh, I ended up, uh, um, you know, pulling back my, my time at Epic and really devoting my, my attention towards this problem and solving it. And uh, that led to uh, us, you know, me and the other guys working together to create Acorn and, um, and then fast forward to today. So Drew, tell us about the near future of uh, regenerative medicine. It's, it's no longer in the distant future, but it, but it's here today. So tell us about some, you know, recent developments. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the world of regenerative medicine has exploded in terms of attention, focus, and resources, both from, you know, scientists' time, resources devoted to it from funding agencies, um, you know, uh, departments in academia. And it, it really is an exciting time to be in the space. Um, even uh, nature published an article about how much uh, of an explosion regenerative medicine is really seen in terms of attention and, and efforts. Um, but I still think we are in the infancy. Like there's examples you can point to of regenerative medicine that is delivering value to patients. And we've got some kind of, you know, early forms of regenerative medicine in some spaces, um, examples being PRP, platelet rich plasma. Um, and there's examples of, of treatments being given to people that aren't necessarily, uh, you know, widely accessible yet. Um, so you have to go to very specialty groups to, to receive them. Um, but that being said, you know, when, when I get asked about this question and I speak about it often, it's trying to find a comparison to get people some context of where we're at right on this journey. And I usually use the discovery of flight. You know, when the Wright brothers discovered flight, they, they were only able to fly a hundred feet, right? It was in 1906. Um, not very valuable to humanity, right? Massive discovery, tremendous accomplishment. Um, but it took another almost 50 years in the development of multiple tools, right? And improvements around flight, um, you know, harnessing lift better to actually take a passenger on a plane across the Atlantic Ocean. So the idea of, of it almost taking 50 years post discovery to really deliver value to people other than the pilot um, is a long time to wait. Um, and, and I think that that's 
where people have heard about stem cells, heard about regenerative medicine, and they're sitting back saying, well, wh when's the value coming? Um, but we have to remember that after that moment, right? So it took almost 50 years to get to cross the Atlantic with a passenger, but within 10 years, we'd achieved supersonic flight. And a handful of years beyond that, we landed on the moon. The acceleration of that technology just took off. And that's the moment I think we are. We're just starting to experience that acceleration in regenerative medicine and the value that it will deliver to patients uh, is going to be astronomical over the next 10 years. Um, that's really where I think it's an exciting time to be alive and specifically in this space. So how is 2023 and beyond, you know, uh, shaping up? Yeah, well, I can speak a, a little bit in context to our efforts. Um, you know, Acorn has developed a uh, solution to solve that problem focused on the hair follicles. So a non-invasive way to pluck um, cells from a patient, right? Does not hurt. Very easy to do. I've done it on my five-year-old, so I, I can I can attest to that. Um, and, and preserve those cells and lock them in time so they don't age. So we now have a premium resource for us to leverage in regenerative medicine into the future. But ACORN is not only preparing people, we're also actively working on ways to deliver value to patients. And so oftentimes um, that happens in areas that are, um, you know, the first and most accessible areas to really achieve those goals. And so we actually are working in, um, uh, the world of aesthetic medicine right now to deliver the ability for you to leverage your stem cells, your adult stem cells and your hair follicle um, to, to deal with things like anti-aging, um, to you know, reduce wrinkles and, and increase collagen production and hyaluronic acid in your skin. Um, it is, it is, you know, there's some amazing elements in, in this thing we're able to create essentially from your stem cells that uh, is uh, important for wound healing. Um, so the idea of using it on elective wounds, right, post-procedure. And also on top of that, hair regrowth. And so we've, we've really uncovered some amazing um, molecules that are targets in, in a lot of work that's going on in hair regeneration to activate dormant follicles. Um, and we can actually have our cells produce that for us. And so these things are really exciting for us. Um, it has been, uh, we've actually used this kind of um, quiet commercial period of COVID, let's call it, um, to really hone in on, on, on the team focused on R&D. Um, and so we're actually moving, uh, we just actually patented this new technology and, and are going to be moving into delivering it to patients early in 2023. So that's going to be a huge milestone for us. Maybe you could just clarify, how do you collect the, the, the stem cells and how are they transported? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we pluck them from the back of the scalp, basically like ear to ear, sometimes on the side of the, the, the head by the ear, um, simply plucking, right? So this is not like a hair transplant where you take an FUE or a plug. It's plucking a follicle. The follicle will grow back and produce more hair again. So it's, it's temporary. And we've got 120 to 150,000 follicles on our head and we're, we target taking 50 of them, right? So it's like going into British Columbia and harvesting 50 trees. You're, you're not going to notice the difference um, and they all grow back. Um, that being said, um, those cells can be cryogenically preserved. And then to create this solution that we're talking about, we pull them out of cryogenics and we culture them in the laboratory and we allow those cells. And there's a very high concentration of mesenchymal stem cells in our hair follicles. We culture those out and allow them to release uh, growth factors, exosomes, as well as um, uh, the matrix molecules like hyaluronic acid and collagen, fibronectin. And then we can harness those down and, and essentially create a lyophilized, um, uh, you know, uh, vial that could then be resuspended and delivered to that patient with a, a hyaluronic acid rich solution. And so this is really kind of post microneedling or during microneedling post la laser, um, you know, to allow for better absorption. And essentially you're re-delivering higher concentrations of growth factors, matrix molecules, and exosomes to your skin to enhance that regeneration and to stimulate production of, of those hair follicles that you're targeting. Earlier in your, um, in one of your answers, you mentioned age and the impact that one's age has. So maybe you can, you can discuss that the effect of age. So age, age happens in every area of our body. So just specifically in our skin, let's talk about that. Cause that's, that's the therapeutic target we've been talking about. Um, 
you know, we pr we produce one percent less collagen every years that go every year that goes by. Between uh, 25 and 55, we lose about 50% of the hyaluronic acid production. And so all of these essential elements for, you know, plump, healthy skin, unfortunately, are dropping. And that, along with, you know, structural changes underneath, right, more with the musculoskeletal system, we do see things like, you know, wrinkles, drooping, all of these things that we associate with aging and, and see on our face, right, with, uh, with, with the coming years. Um, and so those are the types of things that we target and we try to, to stop with all of the creams, serums, lotions, and all of these exercises that we try to do to, to right, stop that march of time. But ultimately, we're really excited to really be offering the next generation, right, of regenerative medicine for skincare. And so PRP has been really the, the intro, I think, of, uh, of regenerative medicine and skincare made popular possibly by uh, Kim Kardashian calling it the vampire facelift and some of these things. But it's the idea of taking our blood, spinning it, and taking that concentrate that is richer in growth factors than normal and putting that back in and around our skin. And so what we've done in our first two preclinical uh, studies uh, this year is actually compare what we're able to create um, and the concentrations of all of these elements directly with PRP and PRF. And uh, I'm excited to say we were able to, to produce much higher volumes of these things. What about the importance of uh, cell function in terms of banking the cells and, and one's age? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a number of hallmarks of aging that are talked about. Mitochondrial health, right? Um, telomeres is, is often a topic. They kind of caps on our cells that once they get short enough, they shorten every time a cell divides. And once they get short enough, our cells essentially naturally go into a state of senescence, like they say, put up a flag and say, we're done. Um, and so these are things that really um, can be tracked over time and monitored. And so with age, um, as you can imagine, if you're drawing upon cells from an older age to leverage in regenerative medicine, their lifespan um, is going to be already what it is, right? So you're going to be essentially trying to recreate a solution from an older, from your older self. Imagine being able to actually draw upon a younger version of yourself and use those cells to create that solution. A, a, a pretty clear example would be if, if you and the unfortunate case of you're in the, in, uh, you know, the hospital and you need a kidney transplant and they say, great news though, we've found two perfect matches for you. And they bring in an 80 year old man and a 20 year old kid. And they say, both are willing to donate. You can pick whichever kidney you'd like, right? You're going to probably want that 20 year old kidney. It's going to be performing a lot better for you. Right. And so the idea of being able to actually create solutions for us from that younger version of ourselves that haven't experienced that age degeneration, mitochondrial dysfunction, telomere shortening, and give ourselves a solution that has almost a reset on the timeline is the objective. So what are some of the, um, I guess the intermediate steps that are, that are happening right now to, to realize a wider adoption of, of regenerative medicine? Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's really being able to control our cells, um, and leverage them to be the cell types that we need actually to, to regenerate for ourselves. Cause everybody is going to end up fighting their own battle, right? They're going to have their own cross to bear. They're going to have their own um, issue that they're going to face in their lifetime and having a cell source that's pliable, um, is very important. And that's one of the areas that we work on heavily, right? So we've been able to take the hair follicle and create bone, cartilage, fat, neurons, now pancreas cells, right? The idea of making sure that this resource that we're saving for you can become these other cell types that are, that you may need in your lifetime. And so I think that's one of the big steps that things like, um, you know, reprogramming and culture conditions, right. To create, you know, the right cells from our adult stem cells that we're able to harvest. There's been a lot of focus around that. The other aspect is like genetic control, right? So there are some things that are going to be inherently in our genetic code that even if we make copies of our cells are still going to be there. Even if we have our younger cells, they're still going to be there. That disease might be in, in, in a much earlier time point of development, but that potential disease will still rear its ugly head again. And so things like CRISPR, where we can eliminate, right? The source of some of that disease 
in those cells that we're going to then leverage, regenerate, and, and regrow. Um, those are other tools that target other issues that we have. And so, like the amalgamation of all of this 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 knowledge that has been amassed over the last while, and all of these tools that are at disposal now, is really creating this opportunity for um, uh, for some pretty exciting work in regenerative medicine that's going on right now. Hey, Drew. Thank you for uh, being a guest on the uh, Pharma Podcast and, and sharing your thoughts. Uh, any final insights you, you want to share with uh, with the audience? I guess my my only insight would be to uh, to make sure you've got your younger self in the future. And I think it's a good idea to bank some cells today. That's great. Good advice. How can our listeners connect with you? Yeah, so I'm I'm on social media, probably not as often as I should be, but you can catch me on Twitter at Drew W. Taylor, um, on uh, Instagram at Dr. Drew Taylor, um, and uh, and you can check out more of our work and what we're doing at, at uh, our website, acorn.me. Contact details for Drew will be also available on our website at thepharmapodcast.ca. Thank you for listening. The Pharma Podcast is available to listen to for free on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and on our website at thepharmapodcast.ca. We are also available on YouTube. Please subscribe and follow me on LinkedIn to stay up to date on future podcasts. If you would like to be a guest on this podcast, or if there is a topic we should cover in future episodes, please connect with me via LinkedIn. 